start that. <clears throat> um, so as I've mentioned before, today is just is going to be a review. So we can and start wherever wherever there is a demand for for some review problems. Um, anything that from the um, gas laws homework that you didn't understand that you didn't understand what I did on the key or why. Um, because I do know, you know, there's there's a lot more to gases than we have time to get into in this class, and so there might be you might have some outstanding questions about um, some of that. So, or we can get into um, going through the practice exam to some extent too. And um, I actually did um, go to the trouble of holding off on letting you see the key on that one until you've tried it a little bit. Um, so I think it tonight at midnight, um, you'll have access to the full key, but I don't mind going over the problems with you as a group either. Um, um, in the meantime, actually, so so while I'm going to get, we'll get started answering questions in just a second, if you want to sort of um, get your ducks in a row, figure out what you want to ask. Um, and then for the first thing I want to do, though, is make sure I give you a few a few tips about the um, about the test. The structure of the test is going to be basically identical to the practice test, except every section is going to have be its own separate PDF. Um, so that I'm giving you, you can upload all of your answers as one PDF. That's totally fine. I break it up into parts because I randomly assign you one of four different versions for each of these. Um, sections. So everybody will get a different test. That means that, you know, if you take, if there's 10 different sections and each section has, um, has four possible um, versions, then that means that's four to the 10 possible versions of the test. So you will not have the same version as anybody else. You might have some parts that match up, um, and you shouldn't know that anyway, because you're not supposed to be checking with anybody either. Um, so, you know, I'm just getting out ahead of you, letting you know, I've thought this through as a former student who liked to be lazy um, and was known to collaborate with student with other students, perhaps more than I should on occasion. Um, I've thought all this through and I go through and I check all the everything posted to Chegg and Course Hero and websites like that. Um, against my tests after the test. I already had to do an academic disciplinary action for a student this year, and I would really not like to have to do that again. Um, so don't post anything to Chegg. Don't post anything to Course Hero. Don't post anything online when it comes to this time portion of the test. It's open book, open note. That doesn't mean you get to ask the internet for help. You can use resources on the internet, but where I draw the line is you putting the specific question out there. And really, you should be able to do the whole test just by looking at um, your notes and, and our slides from this class. I would still study ahead of time so you know where everything is in your notes, maybe pull out some of the most relevant um, pages that you know you're going to have to reference, you know, your polyatomic ions page and that kind of thing when it comes to nomenclature. Um, but all of this, I'm giving you all this background information just because I want you to understand that I've thought this through pretty clearly and it's really disheartening to me um, to to figure out that that you as a group are cheating um, or you know it's usually a couple people in particular um, and I would really like to be able to grade these tests and not be able to read somebody's answer and say oh well that's that's just exactly the same as somebody else's or well, I know that they copy and pasted that definition right from Wikipedia. Um, so please don't don't do things like that. Um, it make everybody's life a lot better if you just got a B instead of an if instead of trying for hundred percent on the test. If you can't answer one of the questions, just take the B. It's way better than getting a zero on the test, right? And it's way less paperwork and heartbreak. And you're way more likely to at least still pass the class, even if you don't get the grade you want. All right. So with all that in mind, now I, I know that nobody in this class would ever do anything like that anyway, but I just wanted to cover all my bases. Um, 
So I will open it up to questions at this point. Does anybody have a specific question or example that they would like to go over? I feel like I'm kind of going back on the same thing with the significant figures, but I had a couple questions on the last homework. Uh, um, like for question one, uh, part C. Are you talking about the first homework or sorry, are you talking about the homework, gas loss homework? Homework 10, yeah, the, the last homework. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know if sometimes I'm just getting thrown off by where you can get three sig figs from. Like, I know sometimes I'm just not paying attention completely and I just miss certain things. Uh, anyone in particular? So like, um, I, I circled part C on one. I think I had it as four, but in your answer, you only put three. Okay, so that is like, that likely what the issue is, and this is something that happens that is, uh, <clears throat> everybody has this issue, um, that, where is my, Um, sorry, the, that first zero, so the only sig fig on the point zero six eight eight, the six and the two eights are sig figs that that leading zero is not. Right. So, and that's, like I said, everybody makes that mistake. You think if it's behind the decimal point, it's a, it's a sig fig, but if it's left of the first non-zero digit, it's still not a sig fig. So get my annotation tool out here. That zero is not a sig fig. Okay, so, and then the other, the main other place that, that you as a group will still probably make mistakes or that you still need to be paying attention. Everybody's gotten pretty used to counting sig figs and keeping the same number of sig figs as, at the end is what you start with. But as soon as we do addition or subtraction, then there's that other rule you have to switch to. And a lot of people forget that second rule. So just pay attention to that. And that's the one where you're keeping the same number of decimal places or the same uncertainty as your least certain number, right? So if you're not doing any addition or subtraction, that doesn't matter. But that's exactly how we wound up with, we wound up essentially gaining one sig fig when we add these two pressures. Because we need to, when we, we have that 0. 0.167, that means our uncertainty is in the, the thousandths place. And when we add them together, we still need to keep our uncertainty in the thousandths place. Because now we're at addition and subtraction, not multiplication division. If we said we were multiplying these together, we would only keep three sig figs, no matter how big or small the number was. But addition and subtraction is where you can gain or lose a sig fig depending on how things work out. Um, and a word of advice that there will almost certainly be at least one spot on the, on the test where it will make a difference that you switch to the addition subtraction rules. I particularly pick temperatures and percent and um, you know, limiting reactant problems. Um, sorry, that'd be more like um, excess reagent problems, where if you don't switch rules, you'll get the wrong number of sig figs. But I'll only do that in a few spots. If you're gonna pick one sig fig rule to pay attention to, just keep the same number of sig figs before and after. If you're in a, in a headspace where you're comfortable with that and you wanna be trying to pay attention to, to all of your sig figs, remember addition and subtraction is where you switch rules. All right, any, anybody else have anything, or does anybody else have any questions on sig figs in general that you wanna get into or 
or move on to a new topic if anybody has a question ready. Yes, all right, sorry, Anna, I see your question as well. Um, can we go over the tables from last week's homework? So I like, I think that these tables are a good way to pay attention to what's happening as the reaction happens because every, con every number of moles is changing when the reaction happens, right? So as the reaction is happening, you're making, you're using up reactant and you're making CO2 and water. And so before the reaction happens, there's a certain amount of moles of everything. And then after the reaction is done, you have a certain number of moles of everything. And so all these tables are, is getting you to think about every single number of moles is changing. You start with a certain number of moles of, of oxygen, you're gonna end with fewer moles of oxygen because that's a reactant. You're using it up. Um, and in most cases, at least at this level, we're going to start with no moles. Of, of our reactants, there are reactions where you can start where you have some some amount of moles of one of your products present already. Um, but that's not going to affect any of our calculations at this point. Right, so at moles after the reaction is just going to be how much did you make of each of these products? Um, and so it's, it's basically just asking you to do four different stoichiometry problems. Figure out how much oxygen you started with, how much is left over. Figure out how much butane you started with and how much butane is left over. One of those should be zero at the end. Whatever your limiting reactant is should have zero moles at the end. Um, and so the, the key, so for both of, for all of these, if we start with 0 0.0688 moles of butane, based on the balanced reaction, we, find, we might find out that, um, so for instance here on C, if we want to know what, the, what is the limiting reactant, well, if we use up all of our butane, that means we have to use up 0.447 moles of oxygen, but we don't have that much, right? So we're using our, our logic to say, okay, well, that means that our oxygen must be the limiting reactant. And so we're going to use the moles of oxygen that we start with to figure out how many moles of butane get used up, which is what I showed right here. And it, we're also going to use moles of oxygen to figure out how many moles of CO2 we're making and how many moles of, um, of water we're making. right? And then we're just using this table as a way to organize our thoughts. Um, it is just a convenient way to look at at the problem, All right? So moles before the reaction, moles after the reaction. We started with 0 0.0688 moles of butane after the reaction. If we've used up 0 0.05, 0 0.05769, after the reaction, we're, we're just gonna find the difference between what we started with and what's the change to get what's left over. So, this is an excess reactant problem. This is a theoretical yield problem. And so is this. CO2 and water are both theoretical yields. I'm just asking you what's the theoretical yield of CO2, and then what's the theoretical yield of water? All right, and this is part of the reason that I organize as a table is it gives you a bunch of stoichiometry practice in a, in a row. And part of it is because it's actually a very convenient way to think about how, how these systems work. You're always going to be losing some amount of the reactant. You're always going to be gaining some amount of the product. And so this is just a way to organize that. So just one more sig, sig big question. Is the reason why there's three with, um, 
with um, the C4H10 and there's four on the other ones is just because when you started, you had 12.00 grams. So you're able to like, yeah, okay, perfect. And we're, and if we, we can assume that we're starting with exactly zero moles of the product. For and sure. that means, so that means when we do the addition, the addition is, it's really the subtraction that's limiting us here. Okay. Right. Because our, our, when we calculated how much butane was used, we got four sig figs like we would expect. But then when we had to subtract it from the only having the three sig figs here, that's when we lost a sig fig. Okay. So one more case of things that behave normally until you start adding and subtracting. All right, Anna, did that did that um, clear up what the the logic is behind these tables a little bit? Um, and if you're taking the Gen Chem series next year, we'll actually be using tables like this a lot as a way to, because there's going to be a numerous types, um, reaction types where we care about the concentration of everything at the end. And so that means we have to keep track of the concentration of everything over the course of the reaction. So we set it up in tables like this um, that are a little bit more explicit. They're called ICE tables, which stands for initial change and end. Um, and it's basically just adding one column in the middle here that was would be just change. So it would be minus 0 0.05769 for the butane. And it would be minus 0 0.3750 for the oxygen. It would be plus 0 0.2308 for the for CO2 and plus 0 0.2885 for the water. So it's, I'm setting you up to, to have seen this before and be used to the idea that sometimes we care about the concentration of everything or moles of everything. Um, and it does make a difference in this one as well, right? Because after the reaction, we're going to take the moles of everything that we have and plug it into PV equals NRT to get a final pressure that's based on all of the gases that we have, right? Because it's not just the CO2 that causes a pressure. It's also the moles of gas and the moles of butane that are left. So um, just... Again, just getting you used to thinking about, about stoichiometry in a little bit more depth, that's all. Um, anybody else have any questions about either the homework or the practice exam or anything really? We can do practice problems on anything. If you haven't had a chance to look at the practice test yet, since I know your, your gas laws homework isn't even due until today, so you may not have opened up your practice test yet. Um, you know, I can scroll through it while you guys are thinking and anything that seems like you would you want to go over it, just let me know. Sean, I just looked at the practice test. And um, so this the final will be set up just like that, and it'll be like roughly 12 pages or whatever. So where do the... Um, uh sorry so i'm out where do we make a break like to send in the pdfs is that yeah so so let me show you i can you guys don't have access to it yet but i can show you what the final exam looks like um without opening up any of the problems okay. so all that's going to happen is Am I in the right? This is uh final exam. All right. So no, I, I need to work on formatting this clearly. Um so it's supposed to be 10 questions, and each question will be a different section. But I don't oh, okay. know okay. what happened to this one. So I'll have to look each at that question. one. Question. Um so, so you'll have so each question, so section one will be its own question so that I can have different right. versions. Um and Oh, this must just be the placeholder one. Yeah, so clearly I need to to uh, finalize that. But yeah, it's it's going to be set up like a quiz, like a file upload questions on on our quizzes that we've seen before. The only okay, difference, not like is, the practice test where it's all together. Yeah. It's yeah. So the the structure of each section will be the same. Okay. But it's going to be split up into ten different PDFs just so I can I randomize so. things. 
Okay, um, awesome. So I, I know that that makes things more complicated, but after last year's last the last year and teaching online, I I need to make it a little complicated in order to make sure that uh, not everybody gets the same version. Uh, and that's the best way I've found to do that is to split it up and randomize it. So apologies that it looks a little bit more complicated. And on our break, it I makes it more scary. <laughs> but so so go back to also, and I, I get that. And that's the reason that I give you the practice test in this format is that is that the pages are going to look identical. The questions will be different. Um, the numbers will be different, but it's number two is going to look just like this. Number three is going to look just like this. Okay. It's just going to be split up into different pieces for the sake of uploading PDFs. That's all. And then you can you can upload just like with our quizzes, you can upload one PDF at the end that has all of your pages of work. Or you can upload separately if you want to to keep yourself organized. So every time you finish a section, make a PDF and upload it, move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. um, but what uh, I might recommend doing if you're worried about your internet connection, mm -hmm. um, you, you should be able to get back into the quiz if you leave it, just like our quizzes we've had before, as long as it's up to your time limit. Um, but what you might want to do if you're worried about losing your internet for an extended period of time would be to open all the PDFs, um, all 10 of them initially, and then just close them as you complete them because then you're not using your internet while you're working on the test. You're just using it to upload at the very end. Um, and to upload, that's the same as turning in the homework with the, the camps. Yeah. That's okay, perfect. <laughs> we don't have to upload it onto this actual program or page. That's fine. No, so, so that'll be just like the quizzes where I've asked you to say, you know, upload a PDF showing your work. It's gonna mm -hmm. look just like that. Um, it, just going to be the final instead of a, a um the uh a quiz okay yeah i need to work on that clearly um and then i have it set up so that it will be available on the 21st and you'll have all week well four days monday through thursday to complete it and turn it in so pick two hours, or if you get DRC accommodations, four hours. Um, in that, any time in there, you can do it at the middle of the night if you want. Just, I would suggest not doing it when you're too tired. Um, I had a student last year who um, started it at nine o'clock at night and had DRC accommodations. So his time limit wasn't until four or one in the morning. Um, he thought that was gonna work better because he had small kids. Um, and so he just waited till he put the kids to bed to do that. And then he wound up so fried by the end of it, he couldn't see straight. So um, tr do your best to plan ahead. You know, make sure you pick a time when you'd be, where you would normally be awake for the whole two hours, ideally, um, so that you're not throwing off your sleep schedule too much. Um, yeah, let's, uh, we can definitely go over number one. Let me just read the other chat here. What um, time are you going to upload that on Monday? So it's going to be available probably starting midnight on Monday. Sorry, so oh. so midnight Sunday night. Um, okay. So cool. any any time starting from Monday morning forward. Um, mm -hmm. The take home does go into the same category as this test, so you'll actually have 120 points in the test category. Um, and ideally, those take home problems, you should be able to get close to full credit on them. You have a whole week to work on them. Um, and I don't mind answering questions about them. You can even work in groups if you if you know people in the class and you're used to working with them. However, you've been working on the homework, you can work on those. Um, I would ask you not to ask the tutors about them because I don't want to put the tutors in a position where they have to draw the line as to how much help is too much help. Um, so if you have questions and you want help on the take home problems, ask me or work with other people in the group, work with, not ask them what, you know, what the answer is. All right. So, um, again, fine line, but, uh, do your best on that one. And if it's, like I said, it's better to get a five out of 10 on those problems than to risk getting a zero on the entire thing. So um, if you're not sure, leave it blank. If you're not sure if it counts as your own work or not, 
then it's better to leave it blank. All right, um, and I'm seeing other questions coming in too. Um, and another quick one for Amber before we go into number one and then number nine. I see you there, Dana. Um, uh, we will be in person in the fall. So I'm gonna do my best to figure out a way I can still record lectures for people who can't make the lectures in person or have to miss lectures for work or whatever reason. Um, but the labs will all be in person and, and we will be on campus. Um, so we'll be back to more or less back to normal plus YouTube recording. So normal, but better. Um, so definitely, if you've been just barely hanging in there, you're almost through it. Uh, and then we can go back to normal classes. All right. Um, for these concept questions, um, I traditionally in an in-person closed book test, I would just have definitions here where I just say, explain, you know, what is an orbital? What is, um, you know, what is a proton? What is a nucleus? Um, but be, that's really, really easy to just Google and copy and paste um, and doesn't really tell me that you actually understand anything. So what I'm doing instead are these conceptual questions where I'm asking you to explain some part of what I would normally ask as a definition. Um, so I'm not necessarily looking for anything super in-depth. I'm not looking for a thesis, um, mainly just, you know, for like for one, well, concentration and density both have an amount over a volume, but concentration is an amount over a volume of, of a mixture versus density is, is a mass over a volume of a pure substance. I guess, or a mixture, but it's an amount, it's a total amount in mass over a volume. Whereas concentration is an amount of a part over the total volume. So I'm just looking for some sort of distinction between the two. I mean, most of you, your heads would not go in depth necessarily like, like mine did. You might just look at it and say, well, concentration is for solutions and density is for pure substances. And that's probably, that's close to a full point answer if, it, if not full points, All right? So this is, and I, I really want to also stress that um, stress is probably the wrong word. Um, I want you to be aware of the fact that these te this test is an opportunity for you to show me what you learned. I'm not necessarily looking for any one thing in particular with these questions. Show me what you know. What did you pick up this quarter? What have you been reading about? What have you been working on? Um, it's not something where I'm going to, ah, gotcha, uh, and you fail the class. Um, that's not what these tests are about. You just have to show me that you learned stuff this quarter, right? And you did. So show me what you learned. Um, you know, what is the relationship between AMU and grams per mole? So ideally, a perfect answer would be something like AMU is the mass of an individual atom and grams per mole is the mass for a mole of atoms, something that simple. Um, or if you just looked at your equation sheet and you said, well, AMU is whatever times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms and grams per mole is this other number. If you've managed to turn it into some sort of math relationship, then that could give you credit for that as long as you didn't make any mistakes with it. Um, not necessarily looking for that, but again, you know, just something that shows me you know what both of these things are. Charge an atomic number, you know, again, Atomic number is number of protons and charge is, is the difference in the number of protons and electrons. So just quick definitions. Um, why we balance reactions? Because you can't make or destroy any atoms, right? Um, the assumptions in the ideal gas law is probably the trickiest one on here because we spent the least amount of time on it. Um, and, and it's unlikely that any of these will show up exactly like this on the test anyway, but just in the interest of, of answering this one, um, what you're assuming in the ideal gas law is you're assuming one, that there are no phase changes or interactions between molecules 
So if there are no interactions between the molecules, there can be no phase changes. There's no attractive force between the po any polar molecules you have. So these are kind of saying the same thing. If there are no interactions between the molecules, then there, then there will be no phase changes either. Um, because we're, we're making the assumption that nothing's happening as we get to really cold or really hot temperatures. So everything is staying as a gas per, that's perfectly behaved, does not interact with anything the whole time. And also um, the gas molecules take up zero volume, which is a good assumption in most cases. There's so much empty space in a gas. I don't know if I've used the, the example, um, if, uh, but just in case you haven't heard it, the you if you made gas molecules the size of a person, the average distance in between gas molecules, the, the average amount of, of um, distance the gas molecules would have to travel on average before they ran into another gas molecule would be like going from Earth to Jupiter. Right? There's that's how much empty space there is in gases. So for the most part, we this is a good assumption until you get to really high pressures where you've got a lot of gas molecules packed into a very, very small area. And then all of a sudden your gas molecules might start taking up in a, a measurable amount of the, um, of the volume. So we have ways of taking into account or basically going in and making corrections in the ideal gas law for this. But for right now, all I want you to be aware of is these are the two assumptions. And they break down when there are interactions between the molecules. So if you have polar molecules, assumption one breaks down pretty quickly. And if you have a lot of gas molecules in a small space, assumption two breaks down. Um, so again, If you got it, got this question on the test and you had no idea and you didn't know where it would be in the in your notes and you just Googled it to find out what the assumptions are, I know that that's going to happen, but don't just copy and paste what Google answers you. Don't go to your first or second or third source on Google and just copy and paste what they say. So I've read all those pages. And I know the kind of language that, that you as a group should be using. And it's going to be mostly language that we've been using together. So if all of a sudden you give me an absolutely perfect answer that uses terms we've never even talked about before, um, that's not a great thing. So don't do that. You can read those and then put it in your own words or into the vocabulary that we do use in this class. And, and use that to answer the questions, but don't just copy and paste. There's a word you don't know what it means, don't type it. I wouldn't say it's a trap, but it's definitely the most common form of plagiarism I see that I, that I catch is when, you, when students use words we haven't defined yet. Um, that's a big red flag for me. I have a question about the gas law. So, mm -hmm. Just kind of looking at, you know, Earth's atmosphere and, you know, the gases within our atmosphere. So what what's between? I mean, antimatter? I mean it's empty space. Nothing, space. really. Yeah, Fascinating. that's why gases are so much lighter than pretty much any solid. Almost any gas is lighter than pretty much any solid or any liquid because right. so much of it is just empty space. Hmm. Um, and even solids, if, if you look at, if solids are mostly empty space as well. If you look at um, the crystal structure for sodium chloride, looks something like this, where you're alternating sodiums and chlorides in this lattice pattern, whereas that makes it so you put all your positives or next to all your negatives and everything is, is arranged nicely. But there's still a lot of empty space in here. I think mostly the electrons take up a lot of that space, but there's still a lot of empty space in there. So um, that's basically what, I mean, that, there's that famous quote from Democritus that, uh, that when we first started talking about atomic theory, all that exists is atoms and empty space. 
Right. Very so, consistent. yeah, it is. Um, Katie, I see you're asking. I know I just went to number nine, but that's a more in-depth one. Um, did you want, you meant uh, the question, question one from part one or section two still? Um, page two, question one. Okay, we'll do that one after after we do number nine. Okay, we'll go through all of the sig fig ones there. Um, and I'll list out the pitfalls. Um, uh, the soluble insoluble table, I, I really like the one from Wikipedia that we've been re referencing that's in some of the slides. I'd go to the slides on, um, on solubility and you and grab that one or just um, not sure I pulled it out separately, but I can and I can upload it to to this week's um, week overview um, so that you can use that as well. Print that off. All right. So if we're going to answer this question. Um, number nine, these are, this is sort of our, our capstone problem, right? It's got everything in it. It's got stoichiometry. It's got molecular weight. It's got um, concentration. It's got balancing. It's got excess reactant and then pH. Um, so this is a good one to go over. This is the most complicated one that you're going to run into. It's going to be number nine, and it's going to be a pH problem. Um, and just as a side note as to taking my test, if you get to number nine, you know this is the one that's gonna take the longest and you're already running out of time. At the very least, write out what the steps are. Even if you don't have time to do the math, write out what the steps are, what the logic is, and I can still give you seven, eight points out of 10. If you have the right process down, you just ran out of time to do the math, write it out. Let me know and that you do understand how to do the problem and I can give you partial credit. Um, so for this one, we start with balancing the reaction. And if we look at just the charges, we're going to have, we need two iodides on the right-hand side. So if we just look, if we ignore oxygens and hydrogens, we can see that we're going to need two HIs to just to get the right number of iodides. And then, but that also should match up. If we have two hydroxides for every mole of calcium, that means we're also going to need two moles of acid for every one mole of calcium hydroxide, right? Because each hydroxide needs to be neutralized. So we're going to need two moles of acid for every one mole of calcium hydroxide. Or you can think of it as you need one mole of acid for every one mole of hydroxide, but there's two hydroxides. Is it incorrect if we don't put the one in front when we're balancing the equation? It's not wrong. I wouldn't mark it wrong. Don't okay. put a zero there for sure. Um, okay. It's just generally, and maybe this is just a semantics thing. If if somebody writes out a blank space, it looks wrong to me to leave it empty. So I would normally write the one, but I wouldn't mark you down if you didn't. Um, our first step for any of these stoichiometry problems, though, are once we get the reaction balance, we want everything in moles. So start by converting everything to moles. Figure out your molecular weight for calcium hydroxide. Figure out your number of moles from the HI. Um, so just a reminder, if we're starting from a solution and we have a molarity, That means moles per liter. So we want to get our milliliters to liters. 1,000 milliliters is one liter. Then we can say for every one mole of solution is 0 0.104. And we'll get an, an answer. My kids love my calculator. It goes wandering off occasionally. Well, this is a problem that you may face on the on the test. Just remember, Google works as a calculator. Just make sure that what you put into it matches what you want it to be. 
Um, so you didn't make any typos, just like on your, your regular calculator for that matter. Um, or any Wolfram Alpha is an even better calculator to use. So 450 over 1,000 times 0 0.104. So I'm throwing it on top there, but all I did was type in my numbers, no units, and just got 0 0.0468. So that means we can fill in, check the number of sig figs. We had uh, four sig figs on the volume, but only three sig figs on the concentration. So we're going to keep three sig figs here. So if we do, and then for the second one, it's going to be a quick molecular weight calculation. I think calcium hydroxide winds up being somewhere around 70, doesn't it? I got 74.816. One mole calcium hydroxide. And we had 1.636 grams to start. So we wind up with molecular weight or uh, number of moles is just going to be 636. Oh, helps if you can type it properly over 74.816. Point zero two one, and we're going to actually go four sig figs here. So two one eight seven. All right, so then, okay, so we're a little off on that one. So what's the, um, so 74.09, we're going to get 0 0.02208. So, and again, um, I only take off one point for a calculator error like that. If I look at this and you did everything right, but you have the wrong molecular mass because you typed something in wrong, um, I'm not, you know, you can still get a nine out of 10. Um, and so don't get too hung up on that. Do the best you can. Obviously, you don't want to lose easy points that you know how to do, but it happens. So then the question becomes, what do we run out of first? Because for the pH, the pH is going to be determined by either the concentration of hydroxide, if we have hydroxide left over, or the concentration of acid, if we have acid left over. So we need to know what we run out of first. And most acid-base reactions are going to be all one-to-one, -one, but this is a case that's not one-to-one. -one because calcium hydroxide has two hydroxides per mole. All right, so we just wanna do a quick limiting reactant calculation. Um, you might be able to look at it and see, well, well, I can look at this and say, if I double that, it's gonna be 0. 0.44 something. That's less than what we have of the acid. So you might be able to look at this and tell what's gonna run out first. And it seems like we should run out of the calcium hydroxide first. But showing our work for that looked like 0 0.02208. 
moles CaOH2. And every one mole CaOH2 means two moles Hi used. And we'll get 0 0.04416 moles Hi used when we type that in. All right, so just our regular stoichiometry step. So we figured out the limiting reactant. We know we're running out of the calcium hydroxide first, but that we're still not done with the question because we want to find the pH. So now we need to know the concentration of acid left. So if we're using some of it, we still have some more left over. We're going to be subtracting it. All right, so zero, we started with 0 0.0468 moles. We're using 0 0.04416 moles. We do that subtraction. We're going to be rounding to the 10 thousandths place. So the fourth decimal place is where we're rounding our answer. So we're going to lose some sig figs here. 0, 0, 0.026. I don't even think I have to do any borrowing there, right? is good because I can't do borrowing in my head. Um, so just if you're plugging into your calculator, just make sure that you're rounding in the right spot because your calculator answer will get you something with more decimal places. Hey, I have a question mm -hmm. and it's kind of backtracking just a little bit. So yeah. our limiting reactant is hydroxide. Is that how I say that? Yeah. Okay. So it's hydroxide because we used more than we had to begin with. Because so the way I would phrase it is because uh -huh. we when we used up all the calcium hydroxide. Uh huh. So when we when we filled it in, okay, zero point zero two two zero eight, and we say for every one mole of calcium hydroxide, it's two moles. Hi, used. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that much, right? And and we we have more Hi. Than the number we come up with, we get we get zero point zero four four one six moles of HI used, and we have point zero four six eight. Okay, so that's not the limiting reactant then. So one of two things will always happen when we do this calculation: either we get a number that says, okay. Where, where your number of moles used is more than what you started with. Mm -hmm. And that tells you that what that tells you something too, right? The logic is if I have enough beef to make 100 hamburgers, but I only have enough buns to make 75 hamburgers, I'm running out of buns first. Okay. Right. I have enough hamburgers to use up 100 buns, but I only have 75 buns. Therefore, the buns run out first. Okay. The, the other possibility is that when we say, okay, I'm going to use up all of this reactant and I get a number than, that's less than what I started with for the HI, what, less than what I have, that's the equivalent of saying I have enough hamburgers to use up 100 buns and I have 200 buns. Okay. Therefore, I'm running out of hamburgers first. Okay. Right. So, so if you start with moles of calcium hydroxide and you get a number for moles of HI used that's less than what we started with, less than what we have, mm -hmm. that tells you that the calcium hydroxide is running out. Okay. Right. Which makes it the limiting reagent. 
And then the subtraction you're doing right now is to get to the pH balance. Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. So if we want to know how many moles of HI are left at the end, we take the number we started with and we subtract the moles that we used. Okay. And if you figured out your limiting reactant wrong, if you if you did that step incorrectly, then you might get that you have negative moles of acid left over. You'll get an answer somewhere that doesn't make sense. Okay. Because you can't have negative moles of acid left over, right? Right. So that's another giveaway that, oh, hey, I must be running out of the acid first. Because to use up all of the hydroxide, I have to get a negative amount of HI left over. Okay. Right, so there, there are lots of logistical ways to think about these. And it, again, it can help by just by plugging in a food analogy or something just to remind yourself how you're supposed to be thinking about that. Um, and limiting reactants are always talking about using up ingredients. All right, so then if we want to get to pH, pH is always going to be based around either we're going to have to find the concentration of acid left over remember it's concentration not moles or if it's the hydroxide that's left over you have to go through that route where you find pOH where you get the negative log of the hydroxide concentration so either way you need to get to a concentration of the excess reactant in this case the acid is what's left over so as soon as we get to a concentration of acid at the end, we can take the negative log of it and we're done. All right, so, and figuring that out, remember our concentration of H3O plus for all of these strong acids, and that's the only ones we're dealing with right now, for all of the strong acids, Concentration of H3O plus is the same as the concentration of the acid. And concentration of the acid is going to be moles of acid divided by the total volume in liters. So in this case, our total volume, just our starting volume, because we added one gram of a solid to half a liter of solution. So our final volume is still going to be half a liter, roughly 450 milliliters. And the moles of acid left, we just found. So. Can you scoot the page um, up a little bit? I mean, that way? Or the other way the other way i just can't what? see what the equation number of hydroxide over volume of oh sorry yes i can let me see if i can do that um sorry let me, let me clean this up sorry okay. about that um over volume total so i can i see what you're asking yes i can rewrite that higher Is that better? Yeah, thank you. No problem. And the moles of HI left, we already found. That's our 0 0.0026 divided by our total volume in liters. So divide 450 by 1,000, you get 0 0.4500 liters. And the unit of measurement for the volume total has to be in liters always, right? Correct. Okay. Yes. So that means our final concentration 
of H3O plus, it's just the number we get when we do the math here. And there's only going to be two sig figs at this point. Zero point zero zero five eight moles per liter. Okay, I have a question about this pH problem. Um, I'm just confused why there's H3O plus when there's none of that in there, really. Does that make sense? It does. Um, so these strong acids, when you put them in water, mm -hmm. they're, we call them strong acids because they're better at giving away H pluses than water is. And so they basically actually force water to take an extra H plus. Oh, okay. And so when you put a strong acid in water, we don't actually have the acid there. Really, it's split up into H3O plus, where it's forced water to take the, um, the proton, the H plus. And then the other piece of it is the, the iodide is just sort of floating around on its own. Okay. So we, okay. we do have the H3O plus there. We just usually label it as being one of the acid. Okay. All right, so then our final pH, now that we have final concentration of H3O+, plus, just take the negative log of that. And again, for sig figs for more pH problems, logs throw off everything. Um, and for, for a neutralization reaction, yes, Katie, we, we are always going to have a strong acid with a strong base at this point. We will deal with cases in gen chem where we have a weak acid um, or where it's a concentration of a product that actually determines the pH. But at this point, we're not doing those type of questions. For these problems, it's always going to be one of the two reactants that's going to determine the pH. Um, and so, and we're basically only going to see these with either hydroxide or one of the strong acids. So which of them you're left with tells you if you have to find pOH first or pH, but it's always going to be one of the two reactants. Um, we, and that, that's pretty much because if you put it, an acid with a base, you're going to make things that aren't as strong of an acid or base as what you started with. You're going towards something that's less extreme when these things react with each other. That's why they call it a neutralization reaction. Um, so whatever is going, whatever is left that's a strong acid or a strong base is going to determine um, the pH. And that gives us a final answer of, and here's something that you might want to pay attention to when you're, if you're using Google as your calculator, um, different countries don't log this, um, sometimes will mean natural log what we would label as LN, other countries just say log. So just write log 10, log base 10 is what that means. So we're just explicitly saying log base 10 of 0 0.0058. And then we're gonna drop the negative sign. So our final answer is um, 2.24 for our final pH. Um, I have a quick question about um, putting the reaction type. Um, I can usually figure out like if it's a redox or um, complexation, but then on, I think the quiz for that section, there was like multiple answers. So would we write like the more general one or would we want to get as specific as possible or like include them all? Um, it would never be a bad idea, especially on my tests where I can give you partial credit. It's never a bad idea to to write both of those because even if you're wrong on the more specific one, I can but mm -hmm. at least then I can give you some more credit for it. Um, okay. Because yeah, because acid base and precipitation are both types of complexation reactions, right? Um, yeah. So if you're not sure, if I gave you something really weird, 
Um, that, and I'm going to try not to do that, but I, sometimes I, they slip by. Um, so if I, if there is one that you can't place, but you know, it's a redox reaction, just write redox, mm -hmm. but if you can get okay. more specific, that's better. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then this one, so two things I got, I got sidetracked when I was talking about sig figs for pH, we're always going to the hundredths place. So always go to two decimal points for pH because the ones place on pH is really just telling you what the, you know, what the power is, just like on a scientific notation. If we wrote this concentration as, as scientific notation, it would say be 2.6 times 10 to the minus three um, moles per liter. That negative three doesn't really count because that's really just telling you where to put the decimal place, right? And with log-based scales, the ones place is also basically just telling you where to put the decimal plane. And so you don't count the, the, you basically keep the same number of decimal points as your number of sig figs if you're doing pH. And again, I'm not going to um, grade you on that, but you're, so just the rule for this class is just always go to two decimal points. Don't count sig figs. Right. And then as far as the reaction type for this one, anytime you can look and see that your starting material, one of your starting reactants is either gaining an H plus or losing an H plus, it's almost always an acid base reaction. There are some redox reactions where there's an acid base reaction that's happening at the same time. But if we look at the individual charges and oxidation states on everything here, um, the calcium starts as plus two and it's still plus two. The iodide starts as negative one, it's still negative one. The H plus is starts as plus one and it's still plus one. The oxygen is still starts as negative two and it's still negative two. So nothing's changing oxidation state. Um, and if you can, anytime you can look at an acid, if you say, oh, well, I know that that, that, that looks like an ionic compound, but it has an H plus instead of a metal. If you've got an acid and a hydroxide, it's pretty much always an acid-base reaction. Um, so other than mixing up the order of some of these reactions, um, you know, those, those are the ways that are the, what you should be paying attention to for the reaction type. So you could say acid-base or neutralization. Those would both be full, full credit answers. Um, it's really just sort of personal preference. I like acid base better because I feel like it's more descriptive. Neutralization, you could think about, there are lots of different things you could think about being neutralized, lots of different reactive molecules you could think about being neutralized. So acid base to me is a little bit more descriptive, but neutralization is also just a very common way to think about it. All right, I'm any other questions? I'm yeah, reading over my notes just to tell when you have these equations, what's the base and the acid? Is hydroxide always basic or not necessarily? If you put hydroxide with something that was an even better base, you could get hydroxide to act as, a, as an acid by losing that other one. You would be going from, from hydroxide to just oxide then. Okay. But it'd be very, very uncommon. So almost always if hydroxide is there, it means it's going to be forming water. If hydroxide is forming water, then it's acting as the base because it's taking the H plus. Okay. And that's what I was just going to say. It, my notes say that the acid loses. So if you just notice any time that, that there's a compound that's losing an H plus, then that's most likely always the acid. Yep. Okay, great. All right, any other questions on number nine before we go back and uh, tackle some more sig fig practice? Okay. All right, so this is the only problem where a sig where a mistake with your sig figs is going to be more than a quarter point or a half point deduction. 
on one of the 10 point problems, if you do make a sig fig mistake, it's a half point. Um, if it's a smaller calculation and you do a sig fig error, then it's gonna be minus a quarter point. Here, because on section two, I'm specifically testing you on sig figs, I'm gonna be a little bit pickier and a sig fig error might be minus a whole point. Right, so, and I am going to make test you on both of the rules and then on how the rules work together. Um, so there's going to be, one of them is going to be division multiplication. One of them is going to be addition subtraction. One of them is going to be multi multiple operations at the same time. And I'm watching what you do with the units on those two. And then one of them is going to be mixed addition and subtraction with multiplication division. So you have to do it in the right order. So it's, and usually the way I do that is either as a, as a percent yield um, or a, a percent error in this case, or um, a temperature conversion of some sort are the most common calculations that have both operations in them. So for number one, you've got grams and you've got milliliters. If we want to do this math, the units are just, we don't have any units canceling out. Remember, we treat the units like they're variables in algebra. So if you've got X divided by Y in algebra, you can't simplify that. So you're just gonna leave it as X over Y. So for our units on this one, we're gonna leave it as grams over milliliters, which is a density unit. And then our Um, our calculation winds up being eleven point seven five five over two point five zero, and the calculator answer is four point seven zero two grams per milliliter. but we can't keep all of those decimal places. It seems like we've got five sig figs and three sig figs. It seems like four sig figs is kind of nice in the middle. It seems convenient that way. That's not the rules. You have to stick with what's less precise. So that means rounding off that too. So three sig figs, your units stay in grams per milliliter. And just as a, a heads up to the way that I, um, the way that I grade these is, so it's 10 points for this section, there's four of them, which means each one of these is worth two and a half points. One point is getting the right number of sig figs. One point is being able to plug it into your calculator properly. And, and half a point is, did you, do the, did you um, pay attention to the units properly? Did you write your units at the end properly? All right, so you get half a point just for knowing how to use your calculator. Or sorry, you get one point just for knowing how to use your calculator on this, on each of these. So double check that. I, I generally look for ways to give you guys points, just so you're aware how I grade. Show me what you learned. Don't worry so much about, did I trip up on something? And you're going to get most of the points on these. No. So the only time you need the units to be the same is if you're adding them because you can't add minutes to seconds or you can't add minutes to meters. It'd be even worse, right? Minutes to seconds, you could kind of do that. You would just have extra seconds, right? But you can't add minutes to meters. If they're not the same unit, you can't add or subtract them. So, and I'm, again, this is not the section where I'm testing you on conversions. So I'm testing that you know what to do with the units, but I'm not going to do anything tricky like make you add units that aren't already the same. Right, so nothing, all at most, what you have to do is cancel out units or not cancel out units in the case of number one. So for number two here, got leaders and leader, leaders on top of the fraction and leaders on bottom of the fraction. So the leaders is gonna cancel out, will be left in moles. So that means our final answer here, our, our units on our final answer would just be moles. Our numerical final answer would be 0 
times 12.1 over 1.000. 6.60 moles. Right, because we had, if I wrote the, the units all still in here, it would be moles times liters on top, and then the whole thing over liters on bottom. So Again, treat the units like variables. If you've got the same unit on top and bottom of a fraction, it can cancel out. Right, and that I think we should be pretty comfortable with, right? Because that's really just a conversion and we've been doing conversions for a while now. You know, like almost the whole class. Um, Again, addition and subtraction might be helpful if you rewrite it vertically so you can see the decimal places. You're going to keep the same number of decimal places as your least certain number. So, so this first number is plus or minus one minute. And the second number is plus or minus 0 0.01 minute. So if our first number could be off by an entire minute, our answer could be off by an entire minute, which is why we keep it to the same digit as our least certain number, our least precise number. So we'd wind up with 146 minutes, right? That's our classic example of I know that this drive takes me 75 minutes and then I got stopped for for, for 1.23 or 1.25 um, minutes at a stoplight or in traffic or something. But that 1.25 to 0.25 doesn't really matter, right? You're a minute late. And then the most complicated ones are the ones where you have to switch back and forth between our operations. And so the key here is to do the rounding every time you switch operations. If you switch from addition, subtraction to multiplication and division, you have to round in between those. So 2.255 minus 2.266 is going to give you negative 0 0.011, right? On the top of our fraction here. So we're keeping our uncertainty in the thousandths place here. And then we're dividing by 2.255. And so this is still grams. Now we have grams on bottom. So our units are going to cancel out. We're going to wind up with a number that has no units in it. And that happens sometimes. We're just going to wind up with percent at the end. But this means we're only going to wind up with two sig figs on our answer here. Right? Despite the fact that we started with four sig figs on both of our masses. The difference between the two masses only has two sig figs, which means our final percentage will only have two sig figs. So then when we do the math, we get zero, uh, and then multiply by 100, you get 0 0.4. Eight seven or zero point four nine percent. After remembering to multiply that by that one hundred, and that one hundred is exact, so that doesn't factor in. So if you just plugged in this section, you got point zero point zero zero four. 
0.87. Um, and then if you're going to multiply that by 100 and get 0.49. It's your final answer. All right, so even if you have the sort of calculator where you can plug in the entire thing with parentheses and get your final answer out all at the same time, that's not going to help you when it comes to knowing where to round. You have to be careful with that. So I highly recommend doing the math in separate steps and using the appropriate rule for rounding in each of those steps. All right, so questions on these. Given how convoluted some of our math problems have gotten these days, it might be kind of nice to just go back to worrying only about sig figs, right? At least you know how to do the math and it's all set up for you, right? Um, and again, I would definitely go through this practice test and highlight the areas that you think you can get 100% on. There are going to be some of these problems that you can get 100%, some of these sections you can get 100% on. Know where the easy points are, where the fast points are. Like you might know how to do problem nine, but you know it's going to take you a long time, and it's still only worth 10 points. Each of these, you know, all of these put together is worth as much as problem nine, and this is a lot easier to get the right answers, or at least, um, you know, get close to it, depending on if you mess up your sig figs one or or units or something, but right, so know where the easy fast points are and get them. Don't leave any low hanging fruit. Number four, for instance, everybody should get 100% on number four, right? Or if you miss any points, it should be on the electron configuration because everybody should know how to count protons, neutrons, and electrons by now, right? So when you're studying, don't forget to review this and brush up on it. Don't just look at it and say, oh, well, that's easy. I don't need to study that. No, that's, that's a recipe for getting easy points taken away. Double check, practice these, and then do it on the test. Get your 100% on number four. Um, I actually had a quick question about one of the solubility ones. I, yeah. I used the table off Wikipedia, but for some reason I could not find fluoride anywhere. Yes, that's <laughs> right. So fluoride, fluoride is tricky because it, it actually is less soluble usually than most of the halides. There are some fluorides that are, that are insoluble where a halide, where a chlorine or a, a bromide would be soluble. Um, mm -hmm. So you would just want to find a more, if you have fluoride and the table that you're using doesn't have fluoride on there, you can mm -hmm. also go, go to, so I always get to it the same way. If I Google solubility rules and go to Wikipedia, it actually comes up with, actually, Wikipedia is no longer one of the top sponsors here. <laughs> um, that's why solubility rules wiki is this first one. The first response is actually a solubility chart. It's actually oh, okay. a little bit more detailed where you just find your cation on the left, find your anion across the top and, mm. and find where they meet. So if you find your fluoride here, fluoride's the first column, and then you would just go down to, okay, calcium oh, fluoride, insoluble. <laughs> so it's same basic principle. Solubility rules take up less space though, because it allow yeah. you to make a lot of generalizations because mo all these ones that are like all soluble, we don't really even need this section right we can just say yeah, all nitrates yeah. are soluble okay got it thank you thank you no problem if you do use something that's um that's not the wikipedia solubility rules though especially on the test just make sure you cite it say i used sigma aldrich's solubility chart or i use wikipedia solubility chart so i know what you, what you used um there's no, okay. you know, just saying i used this resource is a valid step to showing your work for these Um, which also, you know, some of the, if you just use a different periodic table, you might notice that my periodic tables have slightly different atomic masses sometimes than other periodic tables. 
Um, if you're using something that's not the official periodic table for this class, just make a note of it, just so I know where that name number came from, um, and you still get full credit for it. Um, so for number four, for the electron configuration, so remember, these are the ones where we're just following the periodic table. For electron configuration, that's starting with one electron and you just keep dumping electrons in and you follow the periodic table until you get to the right number of electrons total. So sulfur has is right here on the periodic table. It's got 16 electrons. Right, so if we want to write out the, the, um, the electron configuration here, just do it in white on the dark part here, we'd start with hydrogen, say, okay, I'm going to start by putting two electrons into the first S orbital. Then I finish the first row of the periodic table. So then I go to the second row of the periodic table, and I'm still in the S block first and it can hold two electrons. And then I'm going into the 2p orbital, and it's six elements across, so a p orbital can hold six electrons. Right, and so then we just continue on. Now we finish the second row of the periodic table. So we're on the third energy level, back to the S block, which holds two electrons, and then over to the 3p. And that's going to get us to sulfur. Sulfur is right in the middle of the 3p, right? So 3p, and we only have four electrons left. So we're not going to fill up that last p orbital. So our electron configuration for sulfur would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p4. And just as a reminder, until you get to more than 18 electrons, I want you to write out the complete electron configuration. Don't use the shorthand. Right? If I'm asking you the electron configuration for anything with 18 electrons or fewer, I want you to show me the whole thing that you can write out that order properly. Once you get past 18 electrons, then you can use the, um, the um, shorthand notation if you want, where you use a noble gas and then you just say add on to it. Right, so for instance, for gallium, gallium ion, gallium's right here and it's plus three, so it's lost three electrons. So if we start by writing out the, the electron configuration for gallium and then we're gonna take away some of the electrons to get to gallium ion, but it's more than 18 electrons. So we could start by just saying, okay, well, everything up to argon is the same as normal. So, or basically actually what you're saying is everything up to argon is completely filled. So you could write the complete one, um, or you can just say, everything up to argon is filled and then it's, 4s2, 3d10, 4p1. That would be for gallium when it's a metal, when it's neutral. Gallium as an ion, plus three, right? So that means it's going to be missing three electrons. So what I'm, one of the things I'm testing you with this is Remember, you're never going to take electrons out of a full d orbital. Without a full d orbital, it stays full. So the electrons that it's going to lose are going to be those three. So our electron configuration for the gallium ion is just argon. 3, D, N. All right, so again, need to brush up on it a little bit. And like Katie mentioned, needing to uh, remind yourself. And that's why we have the practice test, right? All the most important things we've covered are in here. So check, make sure that you remember those skills 
brush up on places where you're rusty, where we haven't touched it in a bit, and you'll be fine. Um, are we allowed to do that shorthand version, or do you want us to write it all the way out? So if it's more than 18 electrons, you can use the shorthand. But if you're unsure, you can always just write it all the way out. And writing it all the way out in this case would be you know, 1s, 2, 2s, 2, 2p, 6, 3s, 2, 3p, 6. Um, and then it would just be 3d, 10, because we, are, we lost the last, the 4s2 and the 4p1 electrons. And so writing it out completely is a little bit more writing, but it's also, it's the same thing every time. So it's not that, um, not that much of an issue once you get used to it. And it does really reinforce that order in your head. Um, so on that one, we would have 31 protons, 40 neutrons, and then 28 electrons. Absolutely. That's exactly right. So gallium's number 31. That means it's 31 protons. The mass minus the number of protons gives you neutrons. So that's going to be 40. And then if, you, if it was neutral, you would have 31 electrons and 31 protons because they would have to cancel out. If it's plus three, it means it's lost three electrons. 31 minus three is 28. And yes, we can do kind of just blown right through a break today. Um, but uh, I think that that's okay, being as it's review. If you guys can always feel free to take a break anytime you want and come back. Um, let's see, were there any specific ones on here that were where it said label D? So we can do, we can look at this one. Um, this one's like fairly obvious, as, as I think Alan was noticing earlier, that hydroxide is pretty much always going to be a base. And if it's named as an acid, almost always it's going to be the acid. So this one's not particularly tricky, but just to remind ourselves how it all works, whatever is gaining an H plus is going to be the base because it's taking the extra base. Or sorry, it's taking the extra H plus. Oh, okay, there was some on page three. So we'll do this one since we're already here and then we'll go back and look at it. So we could just say, it's not even, you don't even necessarily want to need to label the entire molecule. It's the hydroxide is the base. And HI is the acid. And on the flip side, whichever, whatever is going to be losing the proton if it goes backwards, or you can also think of it as whatever the base turns into is the conjugate acid. The form of the base that has the extra proton added is the conjugate acid. Right, because that's, H2O is what hydroxide looks like when it's been slapped with the extra H plus, right? So it's the acidic form of hydroxide, the one way to think about it. That's why we call it the conjugate acid. If the reaction went backwards, the water would be giving up the H plus. And that means that the iodide would be the conjugate base. Because for the reaction to go backwards, the iodide would have to gain an H plus. Or again, you can think of it as the acid, when it's lost its H plus, is now the non-acidic form. We call it also call it the deprotonated form. I deprotonated because it's lost that hydrogen ion that we also call a proton. The protonated form of hydroxide is water which makes it the conjugate acid. The deprotonated form of HI is just iodide. Right, and so go back up to page three. We can do some more of that.
Oh yeah. So, and again, you don't even need the whole reaction, right? The conjugate base is what you get once you've taken that acid or sorry, when you, when you have, yeah, when you've taken that proton away, when you've deprotonated it, that's the conjugate base. So if you take an H, H plus away from hydrogen carbonate, you get just carbonate. That's the deprotonated form. So that's the conjugate base. If HCO3 minus acts as an acid, this is what it turns into. If hydrochloric acid, HCl, acts as an acid, it's going to turn into chloride. Right? So that would mean chloride is the conjugate base of hydrochloric acid. And carbonate is the, car the conjugate base of hydrogen carbonate. if water acts as an acid, and so really the key part of that, one of the hints here is for each acid below, I'm telling you that each of the compounds in the section is going to act as an acid. So each of these compounds is going to lose an H plus to make the conjugate base. So the conjugate base of water, if water acts as an acid, we're taking an H plus away from it. So we're gonna get hydroxide. And again, this is why they refer to them a lot of times as at conjugate acid base pairs. Because when hydroxide acts as a base, you make water as the conjugate acid. When water acts as an acid, you make hydroxide, which is the conjugate base. They're always paired like that. For each of the bases below, write the conjugate acid. So we're saying, okay, number four, HSO4 with the negative one charge is acting as a base, meaning it's accepting the H plus. So we're going to stick an extra H plus on here. So we're just going to get H2SO4. We added an H plus and it was negative one before. So our charge goes to zero. Right? It's still sulfate. We've just added enough H pluses to make it neutral. And if water acts as a base, we had water acting as an acid up, up above. If water acts as a base, then instead of, well, that means it's accepting an H plus. So water acting as a base, if we stick an extra H plus on it, it's gonna turn into hydronium, H3O plus. Right. So there are a number of substances that can be either an acid or a base, depending on the situation, depending on what you put them with. If you put water with a strong acid, water acts as a base. But if you put water with a strong base, water acts as an acid. Um, and so and I, we never officially defined this term, but if you hear the term, um, and now I'm going to second guess myself. I thought it was amphoteric, but now I'm thinking that might something else. It's amphi something. I think it's amphoteric. Amphoteric. It might also be amphiprotic, but I think amphoteric is right. It's going to act as both a base or an acid. Yeah. So I'm probably going to ask you about an amphoteric substance where you've got the same compound acting as an acid above and then acting as a base below, um, just so you can show me that you understand the difference. Hydrogen carbonate would be another good one for that, right? Hydrogen carbonate can give up an H plus if it acts as an acid to make carbonate, or it can take an H plus and become carbonic acid. And if you you start from HCO3 minus and it loses an H plus, you can make CO3 two minus. 
if it gains an H plus, then you make H2CO3. Right, so that'd be another example, or hydrogen sulfate, or hydrogen phosphate, or dihydrogen phosphate. There are a lot of molecules that could either lose an H plus or gain an H plus. So don't, it's not a typo just because it shows up both as an acid and as a base. It could be, it could be a typo. I do make typos occasionally. Um, but it's probably in this case that it's an amphoteric sub substance. It could be an acid under certain, some circumstances and a base under others. And on that note, when it comes to me making mistakes um, on these tests or typos, if you think I, drew, I did something wrong, like didn't give you enough sig figs or um, you know, slipped a decimal place when I was writing a question or something like that. That's totally possible. It happens every test. I never get all of the, the typos ironed out of my tests. It's just part of writing chemistry tests, just like part of taking a chemistry test it means there's a lot of places for me to screw up. Um, so if you think you found a typo, you may have, you can either email me and hope I get back to you before you have to turn it in. Um, and if you're taking it in the middle of the night, that's not a good assumption to make. Um, or what you can do is I think is you can make a note, put an asterisk on it and say, I think you meant this. Or actually probably the number one place that I mess up is on the stoichiometry problems where I have them written in two places and I'll forget to update the ones in the description up above. If you have two conflicting things to um, descriptions, just pick one and go with it. It's like, you know, write an asterisk, say, you have two different descriptions here, two different amounts. Um, I'm just going to go with the one that you have written below. That's fine. You don't, don't let that throw you. Don't let that slow you down. If they're conflicting with each other, pick one and go with it. If you feel like it, you can ask, send me an email, ask for clarification. And if I can, I'll get back to you while you're still working on the test. But otherwise, just make a note about which one version you're picking, or I think you meant to put, to put zero point two four four moles instead of two point four four moles or something like that. And I can even if I didn't mean that, I can still grade it as though as though that is what I wrote. Right. So when in doubt, just make make a note, I think you meant this and keep going. I don't just because you find a problem with the typo, don't leave it blank. Um, it's also totally possible that you think it's a typo, but it's really, I really meant it that way, and you just are not thinking about it the right way too. So, um, might be worth pausing and coming back to, but or just make a note and say, I think that this is what it's supposed to be. All right, it's three ten. Alan, do you have any questions? I was, just gonna, I was just going to ask a quick question on uh, number four, the conversions. Um, so how many sig figs would number two have? So when we do these conversions, we're going Kelvin to Fahrenheit. We got to get to Celsius first, right? Uh-huh. So 78 Kelvin to Celsius. That means our temperature in Celsius is going to be 78 plus, or sorry, minus. 273.15, which is just going to get rounded off because we're plus or minus one here. So after we convert to Celsius, we still need to be plus or minus one. So Celsius is going to give us um, but negative 195. Uh -huh. Which then when we turn around and plug that into our Celsius to Fahrenheit conversion, TF equals 1.8 times negative 195 plus 32. And reminder, these are both exact. So 1.8 times negative 195. And then we're going to round that 
so that it keeps three sig figs. So negative 195 times 1 1.8 gives us negative 351. plus that 32. And when we do plus 32, we're going to, again, now we're back to keeping the uncertainty in the same spot, or keeping the decimals, the same number of decimals. So we're going to keep the uncertainty in the ones place when we do this. So negative 351 plus 32, get negative 319. So final answer for that one is negative 319. And we're going to keep, like I said, keep the uncertainty in the ones place. So we're good. Negative 319, it's, so we'll have three sig figs there, um, which again, so we gained a sig fig when we did this conversion. Right, but and again, when we do the addition subtraction, it's more about keeping the right number of decimal places, in this case, keeping it to the ones place. Um, and generally speaking, with temperature conversions, that 1.8 is not a big enough multiplier that it's really going to throw off your number of sig figs that much. Usually, with, with temperatures, you're going to keep the same number of decimal places. It's, they generally follow addition subtraction rules, even though you have that little 1.8 multiplier in there. It's not, that's not a big enough number to really throw it off that much usually. Okay. And then while, while you're doing it, can you, can you do number three? Yeah. And that was the one that Katie just asked about, right? Yeah. Um, right. So, and just to give you some insight as to how do I write these questions for the conversions, I'm always going to give you an easy one centimeters that and the fact that it says using only the equalities provided, I don't want you to go look up something on the internet that can let you do it in one step. I want you to show that there all of the steps necessary from the conversion sheet. Um, so it's gonna be something like centimeters to miles or inches to kilometers or something like that. That's kind of a long one, but they're all length. It's not tricky. I'm gonna ask you a temperature one. If the practice has Kelvin to Fahrenheit, it'll probably be another Kelvin to Fahrenheit or it might be a Fahrenheit to Kelvin. Um, but it's going to be a temperature conversion. There's only so many ways I can ask that. I'm going to ask you a, a, an area or a volume one where you have to either square or cube a conversion for number three, right? So then that, that's the trickiest part for these ones, right? And so that's probably what we haven't done in a while. If we look at number three, we have cubic yards to liters. Um, so you can... You can go to your conversion sheet and see what you have, um, or you can play to the, play to your strengths and see if you can find one that that you can know that you know you have the conversions for, even if you have to then go look them up. Like I know I can go yards to feet, and I know I can go feet to to inches, and I know I can go inches to centimeters. And then once I'm in cubic centimeters, going to liters is easy. Or you could go yards down to cubic inches, then cubic inches to gallons, and then gallons to quarts, and then quarts to liters. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. Just tend to lean on the ways that you know you have the conversions for. Don't get lost on your conversion sheet trying to pick the optimum way. Just pick a one way and go with it. Um, and ideally, using ones that you have memorized. So I know yards to feet, right? And if it's cubic yards, and my conversion is just yards to feet, if I want to go cubic yards to cubic feet, I just have to do it three times. And that's not right. One yard is three feet. The one cubic yard is 27 cubic feet, if we, if we cube top and bottom, right? And then I can do the same thing where I can go, OK, well, one foot is 12 inches cubed. One inch, 2.54 centimeters, whole thing cubed. 
now I'm in cubic centimeters and I have a conversion for cubic centimeters to liters directly, or you could go cubic centimeters to milliliters and milliliters to liters, but either way, you can say 10 to the three cubic centimeters is one liter. That one we don't need to cube because the conversion has the cube in it. All right, and so then when we plug all this in, make sure you put all your cubes in there or cube all of the numbers and then plug them back in to, to write this out. The way that I would type it would be, I apologize if that's a little bit hard to read, but um, be one times three to the third times 12 to the third times 2.54 the third over 1000 right you don't need parentheses around each of them because pemdas exponent is before multiplication anyway right and that gives us an answer of 764.55 Then it's just a matter of going back and checking our conversions, see where how many sig figs we need. Every conversion that we used in here was exact. Right. So that means that no, they all have infinite sig figs, which means we're going to keep fourth sig figs that we started at the beginning. which that seems like a big number, but when you think about what a cubic yard is, if you've ever done any landscaping work where you had to order gravel or saw or um, dirt by the cubic yard, a cubic yard is about a pickup bed, roughly. A pickup bed is, you know, does that seem reasonable that 700 liters would fit in a pickup bed? Yeah, you could probably fit, if you think about two liter bottles of soda, you could probably fit about 300 two liter bottles of soda in a pickup bed, right? So our reasonableness check is sort of checks out, even if we have to think about it kind of hard, it's not one we necessarily had in the back of our head already, but that's, that's a reasonable number. All those cubes wind up adding up, right? All right. And then the last one that, so I'm going to give you one that's either an area conversion where you have to square conversions or a volume where you have the cube conversions. They work the same way though, right? I consider them interchangeable when I'm writing a test. They're no different at volume conversion versus an area conversion. You're still doing the same thing. Using an exponent to you to turn a linear conversion into an area or a volume. Um, this one is sort of surprising. So when you think about it, if you cube 12, you get 144 times 12 again, which is going to give you something in the, what, 1600 range? What is 12 cubed? Seventeen twenty-eight. So there are 1700 cubic inches in a cubic foot when that seems like it's a too large of a number, but that's what the conversion said, right? If you've got 12 inches, if you think about a box that's one foot by one foot by one foot, that's 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. So it is 1700 is big, but that's how volumes work. All right, so we're at 320 now. Um, let's take a break. Or if you're done for the day, I won't be offended if you don't come to lab. But if you still have more problems that you want to work, work out or um, review, then uh, come to lab at 3.30. And we'll just keep doing more of this for as long as people want to or until 6.30, whichever comes first. All right, so let's take a 10-minute break. Um, I'll record that as well. I'm going to stop recording this um, and uh, get this uploaded as well to the Canvas cell. So I will see 
least some of you probably in uh, 10 minutes.